Hello, and welcome to the seventh annual Oxford Economics of Mutuality Forum. This year, we'll be discussing the theme, Confronting Systemic Crises, Motivating, Equipping, and Partnering with Business to Deliver Practical Solutions. Now that's a tall order, but I'm so glad that you're here with us. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us in the world. My name is Amanda Catherine Hydro, and I'll be your guide through the next three days. And today we're really gonna be discussing the role of business leaders. And what I'd like to invite you in our participant audience to think about is how you might be able to explore and think about the themes and new perspectives that are shared today and over the course of the next three days with a sense of curiosity and willingness to think about what role you might be able to play in accelerating the addressing that we need to do of these systemic crises. So to get us started, I would like to warmly welcome a colleague and friend, Paul Pullman. Uh, he is going to be joining us to tell us a little bit about what he thinks about these topics. Chair is he, Paul is the chair of the Oxford University Said Business School. He's a business leader, a campaigner, well known to many of us in this audience and the co-author of Net Positive. He's also the former CEO of Unilever. Paul, welcome to our stage and I invite you to share your thoughts with us on this very important topic. Well, thank you, Amanda. And I'm actually calling from the Said Business School that uh, I just arrived this morning after dealing with the unpredictabilities of the UK real, real system. So I'm glad I made it. But I look forward to the next three days and uh, because I believe it comes at a crucial time for humanity. We're especially falling short on some of the most important agendas we've set and I'm referring specifically to the Sustainable Development Goals. Climate change and inequality are probably the most burning issues. And that's why I'm so happy that we already are in the seventh year of the Oxford Economics of Mutuality Forum that is being held together with the Site Business School, which I have the honor to chair. The topics, as you mentioned, are confronting systemic crisis, motivating, equipping, and partnering with business to deliver practical solutions is more important than ever. And we have an amazing uh, cast of speakers. Mm -hmm. Today, we'll talk about the role of business, tomorrow, what regulators and standard setters and investors can do. And last but not least, the important role of governments and institutional investors. I'll briefly be referring to some of that in my talk as well. But what is equally exciting to me is that we have the voices of the young, well represented. This cannot be solved uh, by the people, frankly, that have created the problem. This needs some fresh oxygen. And it is time that we not only give the young a seat at the table, but as I've argued many times, actually give the table. So amazing voices like Lindsay Strauss or Lorenzo Campinpin or Catherine Deller, uh, all with whom we had the opportunity to talk. And I'm sure that you will enjoy it. Now, the ideas behind the economics of mutuality, I believe it's time, frankly, has come the primacy of purpose in driving strategy and business decisions, the power of orchestrating ecosystems at business unit level around that purpose, and actually the importance of enhancing your performance, increasingly shown so across the multiple forms of capital, which is obviously social capital, a human capital, natural capital, as well as the financial capital. There are four key management shifts that must take place. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. The promotion of mutuality, the reciprocal beneficial relationships. Nobody can succeed unless all of us succeed. Uh, the importance of integrity, to be humble and to honor past and future relationships, acting uh, justly and all these things. The nurturing of collective intelligence, harnessing the talents of us all irrespective of gender, racial background, or whatever might differentiate us. And then last but not least, probably the most important thing, the need to make a difference. We have to trigger the broader changes that society is now waiting for. You know, there's no doubt that being a leader today is tougher than ever before. The buzzword for 2022 was the year of PERMA crisis, which is an extended period of instability and insecurity. Some have also called it the poly crisis, where a number of depressing factors actually have combined to create one big alarming super situation. Think about climate change, conflicts, hunger, 
the high inflation rates, the pandemic, the poor economy. Actions actually all undermined by fake news, denial of science, and the war on truth that I think increasingly is also played out at political level. It's affecting social cohesion and, frankly, undermining our democracies. Yet truth, based on sound science, I believe is the key ingredient for trust, and that trust is so badly needed to tackle the toughest issues, increasingly the broader to establish these broader partnerships that are at the base of this. So whilst it is all unfolding in front of our eyes, too often, I think, individually and collectively, we're failing to meet these common threats with a spirit of common cause. I don't need to stand here in front of you and explain why we need to shift our approach to how we use our planet's most precious resources. We all know the gravity of the situation. We all know that business can function in societies that fail. And we all know that there are no profits on a dead planet in the first place. Business continuity will depend on a major shift in the business models. And there I say, also a major shift in leadership, geopolitics, short-termism, and still and self-interest, in my opinion, still slow us down. And frankly, we can't afford that. We simply have no longer the luxury of time. We've waited too long. So if we want capitalism to survive, we're going to have to start with quantifying stakeholder value. And that includes the planet, fellow citizens, and equally and most often forgotten, the future generations. We need to tackle the mainstream narrative about endless growth on a finite planet and shift to an economy that frankly works for all, operating within the limits of our planetary boundaries. Now, interestingly, almost half of the CEOs think that their organizations will no longer be economically viable in, a, in the next 10 to 15 years if we carry on as business as usual. And frankly, I believe they are right. Staying on the trajectory as usual, for example, on climate change, projecting to well above three degrees global warming is estimated to lead to an incremental cost of $178 trillion by 2070 alone. However, by all means possible, working together, staying around to one and a half degree warming, we could actually turn this into a $43 trillion benefit with the cost of inaction now exceeding the cost of action, you also see that smart companies are starting to understand the enormous opportunities that this transition to a more sustainable and equitable world actually brings. And many are moving, not surprisingly, aided by clear signals, in my opinion, from the marketplace, increasingly under pressure from employees and consumers. In fact, we just run a study on employee satisfaction and we found that two thirds of the employees want to work for companies that have values aligned with theirs. The same amount of employees want their companies to take responsibility for the broader impact in society. And if they see the companies failing in this respect, half of them are ready to quit. We call it conscious quitting. In fact, one third already has done this. This is a tremendous motivator on your workforce if you get it right. And not surprisingly, the citizens of the world are demanding this as well. Two out of three people increasingly buy or advocate for brands that align with their values. Now, leading companies and boards are actually moving. I'm very pleased to say that we've seen an exponential growth to over 4,000 companies now, about representing about $38 trillion of our global economy that have made commitments to have science-based targets. These climate leaders are actually also increasingly shown to create more value for their shareholders. And not surprisingly, the financial market is starting to shift. 60% of the world's assets under management, about $70 trillion, are now committed to net zero emission targets. And finally, as you might not be surprised, surprised about, governments are equally stepping up and despite the regretful war in, in the Ukraine that might have temporarily set us back short term, 
we're seeing actually an acceleration and a race to the top. With the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the US, where $369 billion will unlock trillions of dollars on the private sector. The EU, uh, Repower EU package, the Sustainability Act, which actually starts from a very strong green deal, but moves it to higher levels again. The China 14th uh, five-year plan that actually is quite progressive on renewable energy, and I could go on. In fact, every six seconds in this world somewhere, you'll have another piece of environmental legislation. So there's no doubt, in my opinion, that the train has left the station. The expectations on the role of and responsibilities, if you want to, of business are also changing, especially at a moment that trust in governments is relatively low, according to Edelman, when the uh, global governance isn't quite working, when multilateral relationships are broken, CEOs simply can't sit still anymore. They have to fill that void. And therefore, I've always pointed out that to be a successful business leader today, the world actually expects you to deliver societal value alongside the financial value we've all too often and perhaps too myoptically focused on. It's also no longer simply thinking of performance inside of the business, but also thinking about how well the systems in which our businesses operate are functioning. Working now on the broader transformations is absolutely key. And as I'll talk later, I believe that's one of the most important hallmarks of what we would call a net positive company. And the companies that are leading on this front are also showing increasingly a higher return on equity, higher margins, and yes, also command a meaningful valuation premium in the market itself. We saw that in Unilever during my 10-year tenure, not only growing every year top and bottom line, outperforming the market in our competitive set, but actually giving a 300% shareholder return to our shareholders along the way. Now, there's no doubt that technology will play an important role, but it's not the most important in my opinion, but it will help us accelerate. We've seen that with solar and wind. Frankly, it's the cheapest source of new bulk power now in countries representing probably about 90% of electricity generation. We're also seeing that increasingly in green hydrogen, something that many people were skeptical about even one or two years ago. The costs are expected to fall by at least 50, 60% between now and 2030. We're seeing it with electric vehicles. In 2014, the International Energy Agency said it will take about 250 until 250 to have electric vehicles be competitive with combustion engines. I believe that uh, you agree with me that that point will probably pass in the next two or three years time. So we're close to what I would call super tipping points. New technologies rapidly overtaking the old ones. And as they do, they bring improvements, they bring economies of scale, they reduce costs, and they drive further adoptions. And that is terribly needed in the areas of mobility, in the areas of food, in the areas of energy transformation. But the big but, despite all these efforts I've talked about, despite all this increasing positive news of moving in the right direction, we simply aren't moving fast enough and we aren't moving with the scale that is needed. Take climate change once more. In this decade alone, science tells us that we need to reduce our emissions by about 45 to 50%, whilst in reality, we're still projecting a 14% increase. Inequality is going up and we're falling behind, especially since COVID, on all of the sustainable development goals. So this is why we wrote the book Net Positive, how courageous companies thrive by giving more than they take. Most of the CEOs are convinced of the why, not surprising from what we just talked, but many of them struggle with the how. And the question we raise in this book are very simple. How can businesses profit from solving the world's problems, not creating the world's problems? And is the world actually better off because your company is in it, yes or no? Whilst writing a book is exciting, for us the most important part is actually changing mindsets and developing a new cadre of leaderships. And lots of this has probably similarities 
with the principles behind the economics of mutuality. To put it very simply, most companies are still in the CSR mode, corporate social responsibility, talking in their annual reports, in their sustainability reports, which most of them now issue uh, about the need for less carbon emission, less deforestation, less plastics in the ocean. But frankly, when we're at a point where we are today, where we have overshot the planetary boundaries to such an extent, less bad is simply not good enough anymore. Simply to remind you that last year, World Overshoot Day was July 28th, which is the day that we use up more resources in this world than the world can actually replenish. Every day after, day after day, we're actually then starting to steal from future generations. So simply thinking less bad is not good enough anymore. I used to murder 10 people, now I only murder five people, doesn't make me a better murderer. We have to move from CSR, corporate social responsibility, to RSC, becoming responsible social corporations. And the only way to achieve that is to think restorative, reparative, regenerative. For us, net positive companies take first and foremost ownership of all the impacts and consequences in the world, intended or not. Many companies still think they can outsource their value chain and also outsource their responsibilities. That doesn't work anymore. Net positive companies operate for the long-term benefit of business and society. They create a positive return for all of their stakeholders. They see actually driving shareholder value as a result, not as a myoptic call, important as it may be. And they partner across the value chain and beyond to foster these broader systemic changes. We've seen now already with our economic system that trying to optimize within a system that frankly isn't designed to deliver anymore is lunacy. We have to change and work on the forest instead of being myoptically focused on working in the forest. Creating the high impact coalitions that are bringing together the private sector players with the non-profits, the academia and the governments to get true breakthrough. Working with governments to put in the right frameworks, laws and regulations, especially in the shifting geopolitical landscape. Our book is talking two chapters about these partnerships. One plus one is 11, partnerships within your industry and value chain, and it takes three to tango, the partnerships with government civil society to drive the broader systems changes. Ultimately, we will not get there if governments don't put the right signals rules, regulations, and frameworks in place. This also means that companies have to spend more time on positive advocacy, not just defending their own self-interest. The three and a half billion dollars spent in Washington by fossil fuel companies to frankly lobby to slow down the move to, to uh, carbon elimination doesn't serve anybody, nor does it serve democracy. And yet too many companies still have inconsistencies behind their own plans, what they talk about publicly and what their trade associations actively advocate for. So we talk about positive advocacy, eradicating the $1.8 trillion of harmful subsidies that are there, helping governments put standards in place like the Sustainable Standard Board or driving regulation that give clear signals that we need to move to this greener, more inclusive, more resilient economy we all aspire to. I talked about lead, uh, technology a little bit, but I also alluded to the fact that I believe that ultimately it boils down to leadership. Many actually would agree that this is not in essence a crisis of inequality or climate change or food security or deforestation if you want. These are actually symptoms. Many would argue that this is a crisis of greed, of apathy, of selfishness. So in the book, we ask a very simple question up front. Do we care? And do we have the needed courage? And that's one of the first questions to start with. Our book is called Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. So we need courageous leaders to staff these courageous companies, leaders with a broader growth mindset, looking at societal value, not at a risk, 
but as an enormous opportunity to create this broader value. Leaders who look beyond the short-termism and quarterly profits towards the long-term value creation. Leaders who move away from competitive leadership and increasingly embrace collaborative leadership, especially when it concerns the future of humanity. Leaders that are able and willing to create these broader partnerships that at times might feel uncomfortable. And leaders that are able to make what I would call the tougher calls, the harder rights versus the easier wrongs. Now, for the interest of time, I won't go into it in detail, but what we call courageous leaders are leaders that take responsibility of their total impact, that set targets that science actually demands, not targets they can get away with. So they are playing to win, not playing not to lose. And finally, the courageous leaders embark on these transformational partnerships. So how do we get there? Frankly, starts with ourselves. That's probably the first condition. The Iranian poet uh, Rumi in, in the 13th century said it very well when he said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I'm changing myself. What is our excuse for further delay? Is it denial? Is it selfishness? Or is it the expectation that if we wait, someone else will do it for us? I believe it's too late for a wish list. We need now a binding to-do list to save both our own credibility as business people, but to also save the planet. Secondly, we must honor our common humanity. We all live in the same world. Self-sufficiency, frankly, is an illusion. None of us can truly thrive until we all do, until we embrace the reality, in my opinion, of our connectiveness. And until we do that, we'll continue to bear the worst of its consequences. And finally, we must act in the service of future generations. The one stakeholder that by definition cannot be represented in the room and as a result is often forgotten. We may not have the control of when our time has come, on this wonderful planet Earth, but we do have control on how we live it right now. Unfortunately, many of us do not realize this important fact until it's actually too late. Because what we do today is about tomorrow too. Our choices we make will affect people we never meet, but I believe who matter as much as we do. And we all see a glimpse of their faces perhaps in our children, or in my case, in my grandchildren as well. Some will say, with all of this, it's too overwhelming. I'm just one person, too small to make a difference. So why bother? But you can remind yourself that positive change to get to these tipping points, I believe, is a nonlinear progress. Others will say, it's impossible to turn things around, it's too late already. But don't you agree that impossible is not a fact, it's actually an attitude, only an attitude, and our attitudes are fully under our own control? Frankly, giving up is giving in, and we don't have an alternative. We don't know, in the end, what is going to make the difference. We have to pull a lot of the strings but the systems do shift with a lot of little actions and together they add up to a new world. Think about the last snowflake that causes the avalanche. Think about a small thing making a big difference, going to bed with a mosquito in the room. I believe that you're well poised to have a fantastic three days with an agenda that is exciting. Looking at the different roles of business, regulators, investors and policymakers, because ultimately we need all of us. But as we start the exciting three days, let me leave you with an exciting and, and motivating thought from Nobel Prize winner Wangari Montai, who said very clearly that in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called upon to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that time is now. Enjoy the coming three days, but most importantly, enjoy putting it in practice. 
the world needs it. Your lives will be so much better for it. And the future generations will be incredibly grateful. Thank you very much. Hi there, thank you for joining uh, the forum so far. Uh, we're just about to queue up um, the next session. Uh, thank you to Paul for, for sharing those insights with us. Um, I'd like to invite you to take a moment on the chat to say hello and where you're calling from. Um, and you can also take a look at the uh, speed networking button after the sessions today. We have an opportunity to connect with other uh, purpose-driven individuals attending the forum. Um, the next session will be starting shortly, so uh, please do hold on to that. Thank you so much, Nick. And as uh, Nick was mentioning, there is an opportunity to connect with fellow like-minded business leaders and attendees of this conference during our speed networking session at the end of the forum. And so in order to do that, uh, you're able to reach out to people on the Hopin platform by clicking on people and sending them a note. So as we get ready to bring in our next speakers, um, I wanted to encourage you to reach out and meet folks from all around the world, as you were seeing, who are calling in and saying hello. Next up, we are going to enjoy a fireside chat with another of our co-hosts uh, of the forum, Colin Mayer. Uh, Colin is the former Dean of Oxford University say Business School and now a visiting Oxford professor. And he is going to be joined in conversation with uh, Paolo Lorenzo, who is the CEO of Ashashi Breweries Europe and International. So I'd like to welcome Paolo and Colin to our virtual stage. Hello, Paolo. Hey, hi, Amanda. I can see you. Fantastic. We are so glad that you are here to join us and we will have Colin here in a moment. Happy to be here. <clears throat> All right, Colin, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. Uh, Paolo, and thank you very much indeed for joining me this afternoon. It's great to have you with us. Um, I'd like to start off, Paolo, and ask you as CEO of SI Europe, how you came to the notion of corporate purpose as being important in running SI. Uh, hi, Colin, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Um, look, it started uh, quite honestly with um, a point of curiosity. Uh, a lot of conversations around purpose in the in the world of business, inspirational stories. We just heard from Paul uh, the Unilever story, and I went on a bit of a, a journey of discovery uh, for myself. Actually, coming to knock on your door sometime at the back of 2019 and asking you to talk to me about purpose. And I recall. Um, with a smile on my face, uh, the question you asked me, which was, what is the problem that you're trying to solve profit profitably for the world, Paolo? And I recall uh, thinking and saying the words, knowing that the answer was wrong. Uh, all I could all I could enunciate was, we, you know, we're here to make great beer and build great brands. And uh, you very politely pointed out that that was an objective that was not an overarching purpose. I then went away and frankly and quite honestly parked the whole uh, issue until 
uh, I guess April, May, June of 2020, uh, we're in a world with a pandemic around us now. We realized by then that that actually, yeah, things were difficult, but we, we, we wanted as a business to start looking forward and understand how things would change, uh, customer and consumer dynamics, uh, potential competitive landscape, et cetera, et cetera. So we did what businesses do. We called in uh, some consultants and, uh, and had them help us think about the future. And we, we figured, oh, let's do purpose while we're at it. And uh, there, was a, there was a stream of work in there, a three-week stream of work that you know, theoretically would have got us to a, a purpose statement. It became very, very evident very, very quickly that that wasn't going to be a good outcome. So again, we parked it and focused on what we would do. But we finished that process with a, with sort of an aching, uh, longing feeling for a, a greater why. So back end of 21, um, we we actually mobilized a, a sort of a broad-based team in the, in the business, senior leaders, uh, both above market, but also in the countries. I operate a, a, a business, or I have the the pleasure of leading a business that, that operates across Europe, but actually globally. So we mobilized folks from countries, folks from the business, the functions, uh, leaders, but also folks deep in the business to, to, to actually start to, to, first of all, understand why we wanted a greater why. And that resulted after uh, four or five months of, of debate and conversation um, in the rediscovery of, of, of our greater purpose, and that's to create meaningful connections. Um, and you know, what it's given us is, uh, is, a, is a higher order lens to, to basically start to look at decisions through. Okay, uh, that, that, that's great. Now, can you just tell us how this notion of meaningful connections, how, how is it really connected with your business? Well, what's changed? Well, you know, we're, we're a brewer. Uh, that's what we do. We make we make beer, but uh, you know, ultimately, we we historically have connected people down the pub or in the bar or at the restaurant uh, in a social setting uh, uh, to to bring people together, to have conversations, to to engage with each other, to to agree, sometimes to disagree, to debate and discuss. Um, that's not changed. What's changed around us is the, the world we live in and the context through which connections happen. Arguably, we're in a, we're in a much more hyper-connected world, but those connections are less deep. Uh, they're, more f they're more fickle. Um, and so we believe that the fundamental purpose of, 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 of our existence, bringing people together, is still relevant, more relevant today than, than probably ever before, given the fragility of the... Uh, of the world around us, um, and and therefore this this enablement of creation of belonging is uh, is 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 why we think that uh, that this particular purpose for us is, uh, is 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 suitable. We chose the words quite carefully. Um, creating is an, an active verb; it's not something that happens by accident. Uh, meaningful, as I mentioned already, is is more than skin deep. Um, and, and and connectivity, both with each other, with our customers, with consumers, shoppers, with societies, with communities, regulators, uh, is is something that we think that we have a an obligation actually, uh, as well as an opportunity to facilitate. Okay, and let, let let me just push you a little bit more on this. So, so what? But but what's changed in terms of the the beer you produce, the price at which you charge it the um, way in which you market it you know, what what's this change in meaningful creating meaningful connections really done to the business itself it, it's allowed us to, to to well it's 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 forced us actually um given that we do believe it to be meaningful to to make different types of decisions so uh maybe, maybe it's probably easier if i give you a, a couple of examples um we we produce about 45 million hectoliters of beer. So that's about 9 billion with a B uh, half liter servings. Um, we operate a business with about 10,000 people, but clearly the number of interactions we have through our brands is far, far, far bigger than the number of interactions we have talking to each other inside the business. 
mm-hmm. you know, nine billion touch points versus versus eleven thousand touch points. So making our purpose come to life through our brands is, we believe, uh, critical to not just making the brands more relevant and strong in the minds of consumers, but ultimately uh, helping build those connections. One of the biggest brands that we have uh, in, in our European business is a brand called Zubra, which means bison in Polish. It's one of our Polish brands. Historically, that's been it's a mainstream brand. It's a you know for every man or woman, everyday enjoyment. Um, it's historically it's been man- it's been marketed with relatively traditional marketing uh, positionings. Uh, buy buy a second or third beer, potentially you get a code, potentially win a car. The team in Poland took our um, our purpose statement of creating meaningful connections, applied it through the, the, the lens of what we call Legacy 2030, which is our sustainability uh, program, um, and, uh, and, and essentially repositioned the brand to, to, to be closer to nature. Uh, the bison, the Zubra, actually does roam in forests in near Bialystok in in Poland, it's an endangered species. It's a species in an endangered area. It's the strong animal in the forest, and this protective of the smaller, also endangered species. And the guys and girls basically came up with a with a with a with a, with a positioning that, that that talked about the bison being protective of, of of nature. Ultimately, culminating in a campaign that talked about expanding the physical uh, space in which the the bison roams, and using that as a communication platform. So instead of buy three beers, um, win a, p- potentially win a car campaign. Uh, we ran a campaign that talked about the, the, the importance of nature, the importance of uh, protecting nature, and actually we sold more beer. So the application of, of, the, of, the, uh, of our purpose resulted in a better business outcome. Uh, a more relevant business outcome for consumers and, and ultimately a better business outcome from a, from a bottom line perspective. Okay. Now, that, I'm sure there are lots of trade-offs you have to make in delivering your purpose. Can, can you give some examples of the trade-offs you've had to make? Yeah. I mean, one of, one of, the, one of the early lessons that we learned was don't shy away from them because um, folks can see uh, the, the, uh, the lack of authenticity when you do shy away from them uh, from, from a mile away. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in some of our Central European markets, we sell beer in plastic bottles, in PET. Um, in some of our markets, uh, and, and clearly plastic is you know, a problem in the world, we, uh, both in, in terms of how it's produced, but also in terms of the impact it has uh, as, a, as a product of waste. Um, in one of our markets, uh, we had a very easy decision to make. It was less than 3% of our total um, revenue. And so we decided to exit that particular category, uh, hoping that our our example would uh, would encourage other brewers to do likewise. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't. So somebody else occupied that space. But that's OK. That's their decision. In another one of our European markets, Romania, beer in PT is about 40 percent of our business. So the trade off there is pretty simple. Uh, exit and have no business overnight or manage the, the the process over a number of years with a clear path to a different future, whether that's a different type of PET, uh, recycled, uh, using uh, non-virgin, non, non, non-virgin plastic, et cetera, et cetera. The point I'm trying to make, I guess, is uh, the trade-off was stay in business um, and be authentic with, with the business around the need to continue to have a business. Otherwise, you can't be purposeful with it. The other one that was a little bit closer to home in terms of time was the trade-off between, again, keeping our breweries running, potentially uh, after the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by, uh, by Russia and the, the stress that put on supply chains and energy supply, particularly here in Central Europe, um, and our ambition towards becoming carbon neutral uh, uh, over the, the next, uh, well, by, by 2050. So we made huge progress in the in scope one and scope two uh, t- towards scope one, scope two, neut- t- scope one and scope two neutrality. Um, we've done some wonderful work with uh, virtual power purchase agreements, the application of solar panels, 
uh, process re-engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And we've been talking about that internally and externally and getting people excited. Then the war started, energy became a problem, and we were faced with the choice of having energy or not having energy, standby energy. So we took a decision to, to reconvert some of our on-site boilers uh, to, to burn fossil fuel um, versus gas. Now, that, that moves us in the opposite direction in which we want to go from a carbon neutrality point of view. But if the breweries aren't running and we're not producing beer, then we have no business with which to be purposeful. We made that decision. In the overall scheme of things, it was quite a small decision uh, in terms of, it cost us money in terms of CapEx. Um, but having made the decision, we also were very clear that we needed to communicate to all of our employees what we were doing and why we were doing. And yes, it, it was a compromise in terms of our journey towards carbon neutrality, but it, it's, a, it's a necessary compromise to keep moving forward uh, as a business. And we would take X, Y, and Z steps to, to, to offset that. Not with offsets, but to, uh, to offset it. And in that regard, isn't, isn't alcohol a bit of a problem as well? And isn't there a trade-off there? Um, you, so, uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, we recognize that, uh, that, that alcohol, in, when abused and when not used or, or, or enjoyed in, mod in moderation, can become a societal problem. Uh, for years, we've been uh, uh, encouraging the moderate, moderate use of alcohol, uh, providing clear and, uh, and, and open information um, and education, both on pack and online. But um, we think we have to go further and give people real choice uh, in, 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 in their repertoire. And, and the choice isn't about not drinking my alcoholic beverage beer of preference, but, but to, to drink that, but without the alcohol. So we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years, uh, accelerating now uh, in, the, in the space of non-alcoholic beer. Uh, we actually over-index in non-alcoholic beer versus our fair share of beer. So we have a, around about a 23 share uh, across our markets here in Europe. But we have a 36 share of non-alcoholic beer. And part of our legacy 2030 commitments is to have 20% of our portfolio uh, by 2030 in the non-alcoholic space. And what we want to do is give everybody the choice to, to, to drink their liquid of choice, but just without the alcohol. Right. Um, and I think that's a tangible step towards not just talking about moderation, but promoting it. So increasing choice is a, an important Absolutely. Can, can Can you say a little bit about how you relate the purpose to embedding it in the organization and in particular incentivize and remunerate people around, uh, the, around the place. Yeah. So we, we actually, we were very, I'll come to the, the incentivization point in a, in a, in a couple of minutes, but I, if, if you're, if, if, oh. if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll take a step back. We were very, very clear uh, about the process that we wanted to go through uh, in terms of how we started to talk about purpose in our business. So 2021, we decided that we would communicate widely, but engage specifically. So here's our purpose, creating meaningful connections, two sub goals. Everybody needs to know about it within the business. However, we wanted a smaller group of senior leaders to start engaging with what does this mean for us? What will it mean for our business, our processes, our innovation cycle, our capital uh, allocation processes? Um, what does it mean for me as an individual? Um, and we found that in that process, we, we, we had a, a group of folks that got it immediately, instinctively, and ran with it. Um, folks that didn't, folks that were looking for a playbook on how to make it work mechanistically, um, folks that were actually quite worried about talking to their teams and potentially external stakeholders um, without tangible results. So, so we, we went, we took, we took almost a year of, of, of this specific engagement. And then we got to 2022 where we flipped the narrative. And actually what we, we started to do then was uh, to, to engage more broadly through our brands. And I mentioned that earlier on, 
but communicate specifically, uh, specifically to uh, external stakeholders. Um, uh, we, sp we went out and formed uh, and joined alliances uh, for Planet Positivity, so RE100, the Climate Group, uh, Race to Zero, et cetera, et cetera. So very, 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 very specifically. Um, the point around remuneration and incentivization for me is absolutely critical. Um, we've actually been working with your good self uh, and the uh, the economics of mutuality to to make this come to life. Um, I had a, for three or four years now, we've been sending cohorts of our younger leaders to uh, to One Young World. And one of these uh, groups came back and said, Paolo, you know, if you want this to really come to life, if you want sustainability to be at the heart of, of what we do and not just something on the periphery of, uh, of what we do, then you need to put uh, your money where your mouth is and, 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 and change the incentive system. Two years later, uh, we we have just announced that we are introducing a new long-term incentive uh, mechanic that goes beyond just incentivizing our senior leaders to deliver profit every day, but but profit as well as sustainable every day. And essentially, what we've done, Colin, is we've taken we've we've, we've we're costing in the the potential future cost of externality, specifically PET and carbon into our current base, notwithstanding the fact that those costs don't actually exist. And then we look at the sustainable everyday versus the actual everyday, and we see, you know, does would this still make sense in a world where there was a carbon tax, there was a PET tax uh, in some shape or form? And would we make the same decision? And ultimately, we will. We we are incentivizing everybody from me across the the, the, the I guess top two hundred leaders in the business to increase the the weight of sustainable everyday to, to to everyday. Now, when you touch people's wallets, you need to be as objective, clear, and transparent as as possible. It took us a while to get to this because, frankly, the standards don't exist. Um, and uh, but we got to the point where we said we, we have to step off the edge. We'll explain this to people. If necessary, we'll adjust going forward as the as the science becomes clearer, as our measurement methodology becomes uh, be, be, becomes more what becomes clearer. And um, and we got zero pushback, zero pushback uh, from 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 anybody in the business. So. Driving purpose or trying to embed purpose without linking it in some shape or form to to incentives, uh, in particular incentives, I think is is a half baked cake. Yeah, and runs the risk of purpose just being a slogan, a mouse pad, uh, or a, a screensaver. Yeah, and I think I think the point you're making, Paolo, about the importance of uh, relating a sustainability strategy to the profit, not that's just being earned, but taking account of the potential costs associated with an unsustainable strategy. I think that's a really important one. Can you, can, can you say a little bit about what, what has been the effect on revenues and costs in the business? Have, have, have you seen this coming through very clearly in the bottom line? Um, everything's a little bit muddied by the the hyperinflation that uh, that we're living through from a cost base uh, point of view. But I can, but, but the simple answer is yes. So if I go back to a world pre twenty fourth of February uh, twenty twenty two, um, we'd already uh, signed up, I think three virtual power purchase agreements with um, with producers of renewable energy. Uh, the first, the largest one we did was in Poland with a wind farm operator. Um, and interestingly, I was uh, I was corrected by one of our junior managers when I when I when I when I set the challenge, my the challenge I set was, um, let's go out and find a, a source of sustainable energy, which is renewable. And the correction was, yeah, Paolo, but you need to add the word profitably to, to that sentence. 
And lo and behold, that's what the guys and girls did. So our blended cost of energy coming from that BPPA was actually lower than the, the cost of energy that we had been paying through, uh, through, through fossil fuels. That's all become murky now because of the war in Ukraine and the, the acceleration of, which is a good thing, of, uh, of uh, sustainable energy, energy sources. But yeah, we, we see that coming through. The Jouber example earlier on, we, we sold as much beer talking about nature uh, in, uh, in, in Poland last year on the Jouber brand. In fact, we sold a little bit more uh, than we did uh, by saying, buy three beers, get a car. So yeah. some, some of the effects are, are intangible, retention of, uh, of talent, uh, uh, a more uh, exciting conversation with with the with with, the, with with new folks joining the business, but there are very very tangible signs uh, of um, of the impact of purpose impacting our bottom line already. Right. Okay, I'm going to open this up to a Q and A from our audience in just a minute. So please do send in some questions that you'd like to direct to Paolo. But uh, I'll just conclude with um, two further questions. The first is. Of course, Asahi in Europe is part of a larger group. Uh, can you say a little bit about the challenges involved in trying to make a part of a larger business, a purposeful business? Yeah, look, that, that, that is something that we, that we grappled with um, quite significantly up front. So we're about a third of the group by, uh, by, by population. Um, the other two thirds being broadly uh, Japan, Southeast Asia, and, uh, and Australia, we're about a quarter of the uh, of the profits we make, um, and we're a, we're a relatively we've got a we're a group with with significant heritage, but we've only really existed as a group for the last four years. It's been significant M and A that has formed the Asahi Group as we as we see it today. Um, the conversations we had with uh, with our folks down in uh, in Tokyo were, were were really clear. We were we were clear about why it was important for us to to find our greater why, um, and we were given license basically to go to go off and and, and do this. Um, we did it. We went on the journey, bringing our colleagues around the world on the journey with us such that hopefully uh, we, we provided some, some inspiration for them. But more importantly, we stayed joined up as we went forward. Uh, what we didn't want to do was go left while the rest of the group was, was going right. But fundamentally, Colin, the choice is do nothing or act. And I, I, I don't think we have time as, as, as society to, to continue to to do nothing yeah, we, we, we have to act um, and here we are so we, we we have a purpose for Asahi Europe and international it's um, specifically relevant to the ten and a half thousand people in our division um, but broadly relevant for the rest of the group and my challenge is to is to help the rest of the group not, not think the same way but think about the same things hmm. That's, that sounds very interesting. Um, we've had a, we've had a question in from Sarah Smith who says, "How do you measure performance against the new incentive scheme?" So uh, I'd happily answer that in detail offline, but basically, because uh, it's it's not it's not particularly simple in, in in the detail. But basically, we take we take the notional cost of carbon, the notional cost of plastic and cost that into every business case that, that, that we run, um, every innovation that we launch, and every p &L that we that we measure. And, and ultimately, uh, folks will be from this year incentive, the long-term incentive will, will incentivize a greater weighting of sustainable EBITDA to, to, to standard EBITDA, and with an ideal world of getting to, to 100%. 100% of our everyday should be sustainable. We are far from that. That doesn't mean we're running an unsustainable business. It means we just need to think more carefully and more deeply about the choices that we make. But I'm very, very happy to, to, to share the detail with anybody that's interested 
uh, separately. Just reach out. Thank you. Uh, a second one from Paula Murphy, who says, Paolo, what did you consider your biggest challenge in gaining buy-in for a truly embedding purpose into business practice? Look, I think the word impatience comes to springs to mind. I mean, everybody everybody wants to get things done quickly, lock load, and move on to the next thing. And one of the biggest challenges I think any organization needs to go needs to address is this is a long, long journey. Uh, we we've been at it now for as I well from that first conversation with you, Colin, back in 2019. Uh, we, we've, we've, we've only just now really started to, to change processes, change brand positionings, uh, change incentive schemes, re-engineer ultimately the business to be led by the purpose as opposed to having purpose be another lens through which we look at the business. So this takes time and anything that takes time, um, runs the risk of not being flavor of the month uh, after after a while. So keeping the momentum going, building momentum in the first place, keeping the momentum going and, and, and ensuring that literally every conversation we have is brought back to our greater why. It's easier said than done. Um, another challenge is, uh, you know, there are people that just struggle to, to, to get it. You know, why we've been doing this for 180 years, Paolo, why, why, why do we need to change what we're doing? Why, why, why are you talking about all this stuff? And I think it's important to, to engage. It's important to um, educate. It's important to give space, but ultimately it's important to to be clear about this is the business that we have and this is the reason why we think it's important and if it's not important to you then maybe you need to find another business <laughs> to be in yeah. so those are difficult conversations clearly uh, but uh, but that's that's also an, uh, for sure another challenge and that challenge is addressed by by creating a groundswell of um of believers and as you st as we started the process it was wonderfully surprising how many people actually uh, turned around and said thank god at last let's get going yeah okay uh final question from the audience jeremy clark asks beyond the adjusted p l you described have you explored new metrics with a view to changing behavior for example, average percentage of beer sold, percentage of energy from low carbon sources, etc. Yeah, so we did, we do. So those, for me, those are detailed KPIs that are important in in the mechanics of, of running the business. Um, so if, if you're an engineer uh, in, in one of the plants, if you're a, a plant manager, if you're a, an innovation specialist, then absolutely, those those are those are those are input KPIs that, that we have. I, however, think that it's more important to 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 incentivize at the higher order level and make it simple for people to get their heads around. The greater the detail you get into from a from a KPI point of view, which is important. Don't get me wrong. From a from a, a the mechanics of running the business uh, point of view, the greater the chance of people of losing people in, in the journey. So simple messages repeated uh, over and over again with transparently and with consistency have a higher than average probability of landing. And that's why we've chosen the higher order um, metric of sustainable everyday, as I've described it, to to be the the drive or the change in our incentive uh, in our incentive scheme okay and one one final question from me what what's needed to get more business leaders to do what you've done i think everybody needs to go on a personal journey um uh, there's definitely a need for 
the right tone from the top, from from the leader, um, because that will help enable the the pent up uh, passion. I think for uh, for for purpose in business. I, I think the other thing is uh, don't be disingenuous. Don't be disingenuous. Um, disassociating the word profit from purpose is disingenuous. We have to solve or help solve the problems of the world in business, through business, profitably. If we don't, we won't have a business to, to be a vehicle for helping with those problems. Um, and I guess consistency, Colin. Uh, you know, again, simple messages uh, repeated over and over again consistently uh, is is a is part of building that groundswell, that momentum. That once you have it, can become a true um, platform. I'm not sure momentum can be a platform, but I think you know you know what I mean for change in the business and of the business. Paolo Lanzarotti, thank you so much for a really wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I hope everybody has a, a good rest of the, uh, of your, what is it, three days, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Colin and Paolo, uh, really giving us some messages. To your point there, Paolo, some simple messages that sometimes are hard to do, but to remind us of what we need to do on this journey. So thank you so much. We appreciate having you both here and for sharing with us uh, what your journey has looked like. I'd next like to welcome one of our MBA uh, students to the stage. Uh, this is going to be a keynote from Lindsay Strauss. Uh, not only is she an Oxford MBA student, but she is a formal global partner marketing lead at Google for Startups. Uh, and we're excited to have her deliver a keynote. Welcome to the stage, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me and for you all for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, as Amanda mentioned, much of my career has been dedicated to building and sharing the stories of technology that makes life easier for others. In fact, I still remember my first day walking into the Googleplex in California, fresh out of university, and hearing the stories from technologists who are bringing internet to remote areas using balloons and people who are working on the first iterations of self-driving cars. The excitement amongst us was palpable because we were being told that we could in fact dream about what the future looks like and that it was in our hands to build it. Fast forward to two weeks later and I find myself calling small businesses for hours at a time, helping them optimize their AdWords accounts. Reasonable work to be fair, but not quite the kind of impact that I had in mind. Now over the years, I worked my way up and through the company to discover jobs more closely aligned with my own mission of helping more people live with happiness, health and ease. And in many ways, I was able to do that through our work empowering the next generation of entrepreneurship communities and building the future of human computing interactions. But soon enough, there was a question that began looming in my head and a feeling that arose in my gut. Who were we really serving and why? And was this still my work to do? The thing is, I already knew the answer, but these were difficult questions to sit in. And on the surface, the answer wasn't black and white. On the one hand, I was incredibly proud of the work that we were all able to accomplish in contributing to economic development, technology access, and in birthing or helping uh, the birth of new companies. But on the other hand, I recognize that even with incremental improvements or changes made over time by employees and the leadership team, many of us were still operating in a system that was skewed towards upholding the status quo more than truly creating room for change. There was a clear power imbalance across parties and conflicting motivations. And I knew that if I were to play a role in rebalancing that power in the future, I had to learn what other models for impact were out there and make some of my own difficult decisions. Leaving what I thought was a dream job was the start of an important growth journey, and it was filled with unknowns. It's the kind of journey that so many of us are on or will be on at some point in our careers. And so I wanted to use our time together today to highlight three things that this important experience uncovered for me about purpose-driven transformation at work and in life. The first was the necessity of asking hard questions. Next, using technology in a human-centric way for positive change. And last, 
why it's important to learn through new mistakes rather than old ones. So let's talk purpose. We've all heard the buzzwords and the statistics, the great resignation, the great reshuffle. In its State of the Global Workplace 2022 report, Gallup found that 60% of the world's workers are emotionally detached at work and 19% are miserable. In fact, it's estimated that actively disengaged employees cost $7.8 trillion to companies globally in lost productivity. That's about 11% of global GDP. Now on the flip side, business units with engaged workers have 23% higher profit compared with business units with miserable workers. So why am I sharing these statistics with you now? I'm sharing it because it confirmed that I'm not alone in what I experienced. There are thousands more like me at your company, on your payroll, maybe even attending this forum today. And they're wondering what could be. Maybe you're wondering what could be too. And to that, I say, follow your curiosity. Ask difficult questions. Really talk and listen to the people who continue to dream about how the world could be, even if it looks different to the world that you know now. As business leaders, we're constantly primed to think about how customer experience impacts the bottom line. What if I told you that employee experience has the potential to do the same? One study showed that mission-driven workers who feel connected to the purpose of their company and their jobs are 54% more likely to stay at their company for five years and 30% more likely to turn into high performers compared to those just showing up for a paycheck. Now, one group that tried this out was a US-based healthcare company. When they saw that employee engagement was waning, they prototyped an app with which people could explore their values and purpose and make workplace connections to enable the pursuit of those aims. If you have the power today to incorporate these changes into your business, your employees will thank you for it. And if you don't have that power or you feel unable to use it, know that more of us will leave and we will build the future ourselves. In the long run, that will push us all to think better and to do better, even if our email domain, domains change in the process. Now, this brings me to my second point, technology. I'm more bullish than ever about the future of technology as an enabling mechanism to address the deep challenges facing our planet and people, as long as we actually keep planet and people at the center. Now, this requires a shift from product-centric thinking to human-centered design. Not only is this morally a great thing to do, it helps expand your company's impact by building corporate social responsibility directly into the DNA of your business, ultimately creating new platforms for growth. Now, when I left Google, I didn't quite know how I would spend my career break. In a way, life chose for me when a war broke out in Ukraine on February 24th last year. Some friends and I were discussing ways that we could help and decided to build a safe housing network for displaced people in need of emergency housing. The number of refugees leaving the country was more than eight organizations alone could handle, and only a small portion of refugees had reasonable access to funds to pay for housing in a new location. And so with thousands of people around the world looking for ways to help, and even more in need, we turned to community-driven technology design. Now we did this by building a large community called Find a Host that matched 1,300 families to safe housing in 16 countries through a vetted work through a netted list of on-network hosts and partner organizations, enabled through a globally distributed volunteer network and AI systems. Now, all in all, we were a drop in the bucket in the realm of humanitarian support. But as technology is shifting our perspectives solely to the lens of those most in need, we were able to learn a few important things about how to build more proactively for the, for the future, as opposed to waiting for the next disaster to strike. The first was the value of proactively investing in communities and platforms as a way to gain perspective in the areas where we had gaps, smartly utilize our resources, and most importantly, to build trust. These built-in networks range from high-touch expert groups that gave us critical insights to more scaled online communities that helped us communicate quickly and efficiently. These partners were imperative for reducing risk and maximizing impact. We learned from humanitarian experts about how to reduce the risk of human trafficking and abuse. We worked with notable NGOs such as CORE about how to build capacity and partnered with dozens of other grassroots organizers as well as global platforms such as Wonder Flats and Airbnb to make it easier for those in need to get help through their generous contributions. 
These partnerships also showed us how technology can facilitate mutual value creation. Each organization had specific growth goals unique to them, whether it was brand, product engagement, or future customers. But there was also a shared purpose to help people feel safe. And we were all able to use this North Star to design products and services in support of that mission. But perhaps most importantly, experimenting with these new technologies and systems revealed to us an astounding gap between what has been and what could be. Throughout conversations with our hosts, I kept hearing the same thing. I don't know why I didn't think to do this before, but now that I have done it once, I know I can do it again. We have the ability to help. Now this made a light bulb go off for me. Change can happen in so many ways, but businesses are uniquely positioned to create platforms that accelerate positive shifts in consumer behavior that maybe wouldn't have existed before. I'll give you an example. I mentioned Airbnb earlier as one of the partners that we worked with to provide emergency housing aid. This is a company that was once known for helping budget travelers stay in exotic locations around the world. They could have very easily stayed focused on high margin properties or locations. But over the years, they recognized a shift in how people were traveling. Many were feeling disconnected. So they evolved their purpose to create a world where anyone can feel like they belong anywhere. This change naturally made room to build an arm of the company dedicated to sharing space and resources in times of need with thousands of existing and now new hosts supporting displaced families from Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Turkey, and beyond. By building the concept of belonging directly into their brand purpose and operational model, Airbnb inspired others to follow suit and built even better solutions that everyone can benefit from. Like Fairbnb, through our co-op and sustainable vacation rental platform that gives back 50% of its revenue to support local community projects. They saw the power in Airbnb's model and adjusted it for their own purpose of community-centered sustainable tourism. These use cases will continue to evolve with more organizations hopefully building on the backs of others for a common good. And as this trend go grows, it's imperative that more companies build innovations and impact-driven mental models directly into their core business and not just use it as a CSR play when tragedy strikes. Of course, identifying clear impact goals and building it into your core business is not without risks. Things can go wrong and mistakes will certainly happen. But what is the alternative? As we've seen through today's waning workforce engagement numbers, growing inequality and accelerating climate disasters, things are already going very wrong for many people. Which brings me to my last point. If your employees are asking for new solutions, and your customers are becoming more vulnerable due to externalities, why are we operating in the same way and making the same mistakes? The time is now to look beyond organizational borders and systematically think about cooperative systems for future action. Building more personal and flexible work policies, bringing in new faces of leadership, and investing in new open platforms for new ideas to develop is uncharted territory for most. We'll make mistakes but at least these mistakes will be done in earnest and it will be something that we can learn from. There no longer is an alternative. These are of course audacious goals with no clear path to success. And so before I go, I'd like to leave you with some hard questions. The same questions that me and so many of my classmates are asking as we decide where to take our own careers next. What are you pretending not to know about your business or the market in which you operate and how it impacts the world. What would it take for you to face that challenge? And what are you willing to give up? Thank you so much for your time, and I hope we'll get the chance to co-design solutions for a happier, healthier, and more equitable future soon. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We really enjoyed hearing from you. Very thought-provoking, and I think fantastic questions for all of us to be considering. Uh, thank you for joining us. Next up, I would like to welcome our panel discussion for today to the stage. Uh, today, we are going to be moderated uh, through this conversation by Jay Jacob. He is the Chief of Staff for Economics of Mutuality and also the Director of the Economics of Mutuality Foundation. He is going to be joined by Meti Morsing, who is the head of PRME, which is the Principles of Responsible Management Education for the UN Global Compact. Also, Ikti Singh, 
who is the global president of pet nutrition for Mars Inc., as well as Morton. I have to find you on my screen here. There you are, Morton. Uh, when we have big panels, I have more buttons I have to click. Uh, Morton is the executive vice president of Novozymes. And then uh, also rounding out our panel is going to be Chris Hershend, who is the chair of Hershend Family Entertainment. And I, this is a very dynamic panel and look forward to hearing all of your perspectives. Over to you, Jay. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome panel. My name is Jay Jacob, as uh, Amanda pointed out, from the Economics and Mutuality Organization. Welcome everyone to our forum panel discussion on how to center business on mutual value creation. So today we've already heard from some luminaries in this space, uh, older ones and newer ones as well. Former Unilever CEO Paul Pullman, Sahi Breweries CEO Paolo Lanzarote, uh, Professor Colin Mayer from Oxford, our longtime partner, and former Google executive and Oxford MBA student Lindsay Stroud, who you just heard from, on today's theme, which is the role of business leaders in driving systemic transformation in the face of resistance to change. So we're now gonna build on what's come before us through a discussion with four distinguished panelists that come from very different sectors of the economy. All are highly influential in their professions and have reputations for being purpose-driven. Uh, I think Amanda has given you their titles, but I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about each of them as we uh, prepare to dive into the discussion. So first we have Ikdeep Singh, who's an accomplished business leader with over two decades of experience in the consumer goods industry. Ikdeep is the global president of Mars Pet Nutrition, which has a portfolio of some of the world's largest pet food brands, such as Pedigree, Whiskas, Sheba, and Caesar. He leads the strategy for growing the portfolio in over 50 markets, uh, ensuring access to quality nutrition for almost 400 million, with an M, pets around the world. Ikdeep previously served as president with the L'Oreal Group and was also at Procter & Gamble before that. So welcome, Ikdeep. Next, we have Professor Meta Morsing, who leads the United Nations Global Compact's Principles for Responsible Management Education organization called PRIME, which is our new partner at the Economics of Mutuality. PRIME has a mandate to transform management education to teach responsible and purpose-driven approaches to business. And there are almost 1,000 university-level business and management schools in the PRIME network, and also some 16,000 corporations in the network of the UN Global Compact. Today, PRIME is the UN's largest global initiative on sustainability in leadership education for the Sustainable Development Calls. Very happy to have you with us, Meta. Next, we have Chris Hershend, who is the third generation owner and chairman of the board of his family's entertainment business, which is the largest privately held company in its industry. In North America, they own and operate theme parks, water parks, aquariums, cheap adventure tours, uh, touring shows, and even the Harlem Globetrotters basketball team, if I'm not mistaken. Chris's company employs over 12,000 and entertains some 10 million guests annually. I've gotten to know Chris and his company over the years, and they're particularly noteworthy in the areas of world-class governance that reaches a standard far above most other family businesses. So I hope Chris will talk a little bit about that today. And also a meticulous approach to defining and promulgating their employee culture. So welcome, Chris. And finally, we have Morden Engard Rasmussen, who's the Executive Vice President of People, Sustainability, and Brand at Novozymes which is a biotech, industrial enzymes, and biopharma ingredients company. Morton has the distinction of having most of the purpose-related functions of Novozymes in his own portfolio, which we'll address later in our panel discussion. He previously served in senior positions at Vestas, a green energy manufacturer of wind turbines in the Asia Pacific and China markets. Morton has been described by his CEO, Esther Bajé, as having, quote, a profound understanding of the meaning and purpose of sustainability in driving business performance making him an ideal addition to today's panel. So thank you for joining us, Morton. So without further ado, let's get right into the conversation. And I would really like to encourage our panelists to feel free to jump in at any time and to question one another if you're so moved or ask follow-up questions. So don't Do we get to fight over who gets to hire Lindsay first? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sure she'll be sending out resumes after, uh, after this call. She should anyway. There's so a lot of chatter at least. I'm oh, sorry? There's a lot of chit chat in the chat room I can see already on Lindsay, so that's good. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. She was terrific. So let's start with you, Ikdeep. So what's your vision of the role of Mars Pet Nutrition? Uh, what should it be playing in the world, increasingly beset by crises? And what are the biggest challenges you face on executing that vision? Well, first, Jay, thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor uh, and a privilege to be here. So just a bit about Mars. Um, for those who don't know, Mars is a privately held company. It was founded in, about, found in 1911, and for the last 112 years has been grounded in five principles and a belief that a company should be a force for good. 
actually, I have a company's objective, which is a letter that was actually written by one of the founding uh, members, uh, actually Forrest Mars Jr., who is the son of the founder, Frank Mars. Uh, in 1947, he defined the objective of the company as creating mutual benefit for all stakeholders through the manufacturing of our products. And fast forward 112 years ago uh, later, we still measure success today. Uh, it's actually through a compass and the compass actually includes financial measures, but actually non-financial measures. Um, and in 2019, we committed to actually one of our boldest ambitions, which is one was to double the size of the business. But secondly, it's about becoming a sustainable business in a generation by investing in three areas. The first area is a healthy planet and where we have committed to reducing greenhouse uh, emissions by about 27% by 2025 and by 67% by 2050. And also while making sure that we have 100% recycled packaging. The second piece is of thriving people where we actually meaningfully wanna make a difference in the lives of 1 million people around our value chain. And we have done a few things around uh, Farmers Income Lab and Livelihood Fund where we are actually promoting sustainable agriculture in over 200,000 farms. And finally, it's about nourishing well-being, providing people with access to information and products they need to stay healthy. Uh, but beyond products for people, we also serve half of the world's pets. So if you look at that, that's kind of like our purpose. And that's a company that is anchored in a very powerful belief that the com a company should be a force for good. The challenges that we face is you know, when it's a journey, I think I was listening to Paolo uh, from Asahi in the last panel. And when you are purpose driven, the journey requires a big change in mindset. It requires patience uh, to think long term. And we are lucky that we are privately held. And as a result of that, we think in generations and not in quarters. And as a result of that, we always take a long term view of what we really want to achieve as a as overall a business objective. And the second thing is we have to remain anchored in our purpose and belief. Finally, while it's, it's, it's easy to kind of, you know, get uh, into the short term uh, look uh, into the ROIs and not really see the ROI for purpose initiatives, what we have found actually working with the economics of mutuality team that if you actually have a sharp purpose, one can deliver both the short term and the long term. And I'll just give you one example of that. Um, so in pet nutrition, which is the business that I work on, our purpose is specifically linked with making or solving pet parent pain points. So all of us, most of us have pets, but we weren't born pet parents. We actually became pet parents. And along the way, we had learned how to adopt a pet, how to raise a pet, how to feed a pet, how to take care of it. And we aspire to actually solve all those pain points. And by solving those pain points, we actually end up creating innovation in products and services that actually helps us um, actually grow revenues. So that's a bit of what the, the business is all about. And that's our vision. Thanks for asking. Well, thank you, uh, Ikti. I just wanted to ask a quick follow up question. So you talked about a change of mindset being critically important. So is this uh, ecosystem pain point uh, approach that you've adopted, is that part of this change of mindset? rather than looking just internally, uh, actually looking from a purpose perspective externally at problems you can solve of others? Absolutely, and I think it's a, it's a shift that actually started more than seven years ago. Uh, overall, the pet care division, our, our purpose is to make a better world for pets. And so we actually you think about it, the company was actually a pet food manufacturer, and it's now become the, actually a pet food manufacturer, the largest one at that, but also a pet healthcare provider. We actually are also the biggest uh, owners of uh, healthcare uh, veterinary services for, for pets. Uh, we actually uh, have close to 100,000 employees worldwide. We actually have uh, clinics uh, all over the world. We have diagnostics and science labs all over the world. And of course, we also have the leading pet food brands. But along the way, all the innovation is looking at the entire ecosystem of services we own but it's all about at the service of solving pain points. Terrific. Thank you very much. Chris, what about the entertainment industry? What's your vision for Hirsch and Family Entertainment? And what are the top challenges you're facing in executing on that vision? Well, in similar to Ikdeep, we have a pretty simple vision. It's really just to bring families closer together. Um, that's what we do. 
so that gives us a lot of room to do and a lot of fun things to bless people really uh we tend to be in communities that um are what i would call uh side communities smaller uh, not always but often smaller towns so we're often the largest employer we're an opportunity for people to have dignified work i mean you think of a theme park worker your picture in your mind may not be somebody who's engaged and and committed but we have a long long history of multi-year returners to our parks and our attractions and that's something that as shareholders we talk about all the time and then on the product side those people are empowered to deliver something where they really feel like their job is to love our guests and they love these families that come visit us and in the big scheme of things we feel like that's kind of what the world needs i know we're not um, doing some things that are considered, you know, uh, maybe scientific breakthroughs or, you know, we're not curing cancer and things like that, but people need people and they need to be together and they need to laugh and just simply be outside together in a day where they don't have any other cares. So we love doing that for our families and giving them a break from whatever it is that's, um, kind of weighing them down. So it's, it's pretty simple. It's been about 70 years. We've kind of been doing the same thing over and over and over. And it's compounded over decades now to where we feel like we are really just starting to hit our stride, where we really feel like we can articulate plainly to our team, uh, you know, why we exist, what their role is, and how they fit into a larger purpose. Um, it's not just, you know, selling popcorn and funnel cakes. It's really something much more significant. And can you flag one or two major obstacles you're facing, Chris, in delivering on that vision? Maybe 12. How much time have we got? <laughs> Not enough for all of them. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that the biggest thing for us in North America has been the labor markets and just reminding people, you know, what the benefits are of working in a community. Uh, it's hard work, um, but we've been able to combat it because we've, like I said, this kind of hard earned multi-year reputation for not being a, a paternalistic culture where I'm going to take care of your every need, but really a place where you're needed and your work has great dignity and the people you work with care about you. And we measure that and we measure it not only from a supervisory level, um, but also from the peers, the people, you know, by your side. And that's, that has helped us combat what I think is the biggest single threat, which is sort of people not wanting to come back to work. Um, but we've been able to grow the business pretty substantially, uh, even since the pandemic. And um, it's not just pricing power, you know, it's not just inflation. It's really been an ability to attract and retain people in an environment where there's plenty of reasons not to come back at all. I mean, savings rates have been very high. Our wage um, is competitive. It's always competitive. We always make sure to do that. But, you know, it's not a high, high wage job. And there's just a lot of pressure to keep people at home or in other places. So we've been able to combat that successfully, largely on the back of, I think, culture. There's really not a management system that can explain exactly why we're having success right now. It's a large, I think to a large degree, it's a factor of the way we treat people. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I'd like to come back later in this discussion to this talent attraction retention issue, because I know it's a big one for everyone here. Morton, how about in your sector of the economy? What about Novozymes and its vision and obstacles? Yeah. So I, first of all, I, I really like uh, Chris's, uh, and you shouldn't be humble about the simplicity. I think really speaking from the heart and, and to the heart of individuals, that, that is where the secret sauce is in many times. At Noble Symes, as you are describing us, we're pretty broad. We are in actually 700 different products across 34 different industries, uh, varying from uh, farm, uh, how you can create the uh, biological inoculants uh, for farming your field, uh, to how you produce uh, more out of your crops from uh, from uh, your fields as well, bring it to the table, coming up with new solutions on alternative proteins and ensuring there's enough proteins on the table for everyone, looking across some of the, the challenges that the world are facing today. And at the same time, we're looking at how can we apply that into household care, creating more uh, biological uh, detergents, how can we enable and utilize more uh, biological solutions in when you're doing fermentation of uh, different products. So the last decade, we have been working with a triple bottom line, a bit like uh, it they talked about. So we have a, a one pillar is our finances, where we over the next uh, seven years need to double our revenue. We also have a pillar, 
where we look at uh, our operations. So the way we actually produce our uh, our products needs to be uh, net zero. We need to transform our business. Uh, and then we have a third pillar, which is our CIMAS, which is our employees and the society in which we engage in. And to each of these, you really need to be able to link what it is you're doing so it doesn't just become bullshit when you're explaining it to people. So today we go out and we report out on how much revenue, uh, total revenue, I actually dedicated in our uh, finance uh, leg on that are uh, supporting our ESG targets and the missions that we have of transforming the world to a net zero society and transforming uh, to a healthier planet and a healthier lives. Uh, we also have uh, put forward like a lot of other companies on how we want to reduce our CO2 emissions. We have already reduced with 63% uh, our CO2 emission from 2018 to 2022 while growing our top line. We have uh, now more than 80% of our, uh, our electricity is coming from renewable energies on a global level. And on the third one, on, on our employees, we of course work with uh, uh, looking at how we want to drive the diversity in our business. But another part, we also want to be able to go out and inspire. We allow all of our employees to take 1% of their time and, and go out and do good for the societies where they live and where they are. We truly believe, and that's what I liked about Chris's comment on, that we all belong to a society. We all belong in a community. And no matter how big you extrapolate it out from a world perspective or in around the site where you are, you have an obligation to go out and inspire. So that means in Mumbai, we are going out and we are creating uh, water wells. We are supporting the local communities. As we saw with the Ukraine, Ukraine wall that uh, broke out a year ago, we are having ability to go out and center both with money to support ideas from employees to go out and engage locally. We see now in Turkey uh, where we have a uh, fairly big presence, where we have the ability on a weekly basis to take every Monday morning out to go and pack uh, uh, produce, uh, products that is uh, needed in the eastern part of Turkey. And we allow this because it creates a massive, massive value for the individual community and the individual employee uh, in that process. Thank you, Morton, especially for, for bringing up the concept of place, because we talk a lot about in this space, people and planet, but place is often not as prominent and yet it's so related to the first two. So I'd like to pick up on that you know, a little bit later. I hope we have time for that. I'd like to just shift gears a little bit and ask you, Meta, uh, how, how do you see the role of your prime organization at the United Nations uh, and that, that you lead this organization in transforming business education? Can you tell us a little bit about what exactly are you trying to accomplish with this? And what are the major obstacles you're going to have to overcome in doing so? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for having me here, Jay, today. I really enjoyed it. And I'm always impressed uh, listening to uh, great uh, advances, great progress from, from a lot of our businesses. And of course, in particular, the three in, in this very panel. And uh, normally I'm based in New York in the UN Global Compact office. Uh, but today I am actually physically at Oxford. So what you see here behind me is uh, is actually happening <laughs> also in real Real life. No, uh, but I've over the past three years have been heading up uh, prime principles for responsible management education. And our ambition is to, you could say, advance progress, inspire uh, the almost 1,000 business schools that are part of our community globally. And we are the United Nations largest initiative on responsible management working to uh, the towards the SDGs. And let me just start by reminding uh, you in case you've forgotten that one in three, 33% of all students that come out globally every year with a degree in from undergrad studi studies or from graduate studies, they come out with a degree in business, economics, law or management. So one third of all graduations from tertiary university come out with a business study. Uh, so it's about 70, 70 million students we produce every year. And these students are the future leaders in your companies, uh, in your businesses, and uh, they're going to set the tone, the mindset, as uh, we've heard uh, Chris also talk about here, the mindset for how these businesses, your businesses are making decisions, what kind of frameworks, 
what kind of uh, thinking that goes behind uh, making a decision in one way or another. So it's not a trivial pursuit. Uh, it's not uh, indifferent what we bring into the classrooms of these students. So that's what, what our ambition actually is is to change what is brought into that classroom, transform what is brought into the classroom. When I was educated quite some years ago, the idea was focused only on short-termism, on the shareholder supremacy, on one particular way of thinking about growth, uh, about scaling in one particular way. And I think that rethinking of the business model that we have heard already on this panel is what we need to see much more of. Unfortunately, the, the three companies uh, that you represent here today are, are not the usual ones. Uh, that need, we need to have a lot more uh, like, that, like you, will lead and inspire uh, the rest of the businesses out there. So that's what we try to do via education and via leadership education uh, is, is uh, where we focus. I think one of the challenges, and I think that's always, always a very good uh, Question And there are a lot of, of challenges for us, but I think one of the challenges is to uh, have South and North speak with one more, more, uh, another, having our schools uh, and our business schools in the South teach the business schools in the North, inspire the business schools in the North and vice versa to uh, understand with each other, learn from each other how uh, we can uh, educate our students because they, these students, they will be, they may be placed in a particular space or a place as we, we heard uh, about before, but they will all somehow have to relate to a global community from where they source, from where they sell, where they inspire, uh, etc. So I think that global um, learning from one another uh, and, and having that with a long-term perspective is one of our challenges. Oh, thank you, Meta. And you know, I've had some great conversations offline about this idea of, of kind of shifting the way business operates and business is taught in business schools from sort of profit maximization and uh, risk mitigation with a little bit of, of impact kind of uh, pasted on the side to Im measurable impact, really driving superior value creation and performance. And so really, it was, definitely, sorry? It's a huge, I mean, it's a, it's a real dilemma. You come out thinking maximize shareholder value yet. It, that's not, in direct conflict, increasing shareholder value certainly is never in direct conflict with doing the right thing and all these other communities and mm -hmm. stakeholders. But it was, it took me years. I had this existential like crisis inside trying to figure out how to reconcile what I believe to be true and what I've been taught because they weren't totally oppositional. They were complementary, but I had to work through it in a way that I'm sure I would be much faster at had I gone through school under, under uh, your regime, Meta. Yeah, that gets back to what Ikdeep said too about that just change of mindset and how how tough it is sometimes when you stand where you sit. You know, all the business schools are teaching you one way of uh, doing business, and then that's the way your company is operating. How do you then put yourself in that space where you can shift the thinking? And actually, Meta, I wanted to pick up on something you, you've mentioned to me also in the past, uh, just to take our conversation into a, a further direction here. Uh, you've you've shared to me in the past that you've had a lot of conversations with CEOs uh, in your role, and that sometimes these CEOs will actually complain uh, to you that business schools are not graduating students with the right skill sets to manage to more responsible, purpose-driven business outcomes, you know, all of these outcomes that these business leaders are being pressured to, uh, to, to deliver. So could, could you just elaborate a little bit on those conversations and, uh, and what you have been hearing? Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I think it feeds directly into one of the comments that was just raised by someone, I forgot the last name, Susanna, uh, in the chat here about Taking, bringing the students out of the classroom, not just uh, bring the students and profess, as I call it, professing for them in the classroom. You know, this is how I've been teaching myself uh, as a professor in a lot of classrooms is professing, more or less pacifying my students because I come in as the educated professor who's going to teach my students what they should think, what the curriculum looks like. And then by the end of the semester, I will examine them if they have if they are able to imitate what I told them, if they're able to repeat uh, the text that they have read. So actually Im imitation and repetition becomes the skill set that uh, we have uh, for too many years been uh, valuing in amongst our students. We need a different skill set, Jay, as, you, as you're saying, and as, as many CEOs are asking for, a different kind of skill set where students are able to think 
interdisciplinarily. We, we, uh, we need to understand that we may have a subject matter of accounting and a finance and marketing, organization theory, but students need to think across and need to be able to, uh, when they're out there in, in practical, uh, uh, practical dilemmas, they need to understand how these disciplines come together, how they make decisions in complex um, society what we refer to as wicked problems, problems that have no predefined solutions. And that's where we need this, the skill set of the students to be, for them to be much more those who are able to ask the questions, to identify the dilemmas, not in a case study that has meticulously been sort of chewed over 20 pages and where there's only one right answer. The students need for themselves to think, what's the problem? How can I make uh, find new solutions uh, to these problems? And that will sort of, it, it points directly back to ourselves as professors in that classroom. It demands a new kind of skill set from us as professors, how we mobilize our students uh, to sort of be those creative uh, sol solution make makers and those change makers that are needed in, in practical uh, business life today. Thank you, better. I'd actually like to ask Ikdeep and Morton if you could um, uh, just share your thoughts from your respective roles as to uh, uh, Meta's observation. Are, are the new employees that are coming into your organizations, do they have, they may have the passion for operating in a new way, but do they have the right skill sets? What are you seeing and what are you looking for? Maybe I'll go first. Uh, I would say, you know, broadly, broadly speaking, you know, we we get a lot of brilliant um, candidates coming in. And I think the question that we're all trying to, uh, as leaders, uh, lean into is really kind of le leaning into what's going to lie ahead of us. Can you see where the world is going? And then can I lead through some ambiguity and motivate action based on a vision? And I think that vision has to be, in essence, be locked in that business can be a force for good. And that's what we are trying to find uh, when we talk about like-minded, valued people who can become associates for us, because that's the kind of leaders we want to see uh, come out, uh, people who can drive results, but more importantly, also make impact to society. So that's kind of like my take on it. Morton? So what I like about Meta's comment was that we should shift away from uh, sitting and doing professoring, or how you called it, that we just sit and, and command and then test, test them at the end of the year. I actually think that also goes for companies. If you're a leader in the future, and we heard Lindsay talk to it, if we don't revisit the way we actually are running and doing and tasking our business from day to day, then we are going to lose the, the best minds. And that's why for me, it's so important in, in Novel Science that we have these three pillars. And it's not to sit here and talk about the percentages, but if we are not, if we are not able to actually demonstrate and walk the truth, we're going to be have all the talents in the world see straight through us and, and leave us. So I really think that when we're looking for talent, we're looking for, of course, people coming with the educational background and the formal education, but also people that are curious, that are going out and have a curiosity on technologies, on thinking differently uh, for the future. Had I said uh, 10 years ago and said that we will be building uh, alternative protein uh, factories in North America that will enable uh, alternative uh, meat patties, well, it was probably a bit far-fetched. But now we sit in a world where we're talking about how our enzymes can be replicated out and doing enzymatic carbon capture on, uh, on factories. We need to have individuals that has a formal education but is curious and I think that's really what lies and what we're looking for is individuals that has that curiosity to combine different technologies and ways of thinking, ways of uh, different perspectives. Right. Thank you. I'd like to just get a little deeper into this topic of, of purpose-driven businesses. And I'll give this next question first to you, Chris. Uh, an Oxford professor named Clive Staples Lewis said a century ago uh, the following about purpose. He said, purpose is like a light and you don't turn on a light in a dark room to then stare at the light. And I think the idea here is that the light is meant to illuminate what's in the dark room. And for business, this could be illuminating the problems or challenges of stakeholders in an ecosystem built around a shared purpose for a business activity. But staring at the light uh, might be by those companies, and there are many of them, that don't necessarily connect their purpose to their strategy and to their incentive system, but rather create a purpose 
that's meant to be inspirational and maybe to generate positive corporate reputation, but really isn't practically actionable. So could you tell us, Chris, a little bit about how your family entertainment business looks at this idea of purpose and how it's able or not able to deliver this purpose through strategy? And if you've got any examples that are specific, that would be terrific. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually just like to hear the question again because I loved it so much. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a great point. We, we kind of start, we have, we have three shareholder objectives since 98. We've had the same three. And it starts with people and employees. And we use the word treasured. And then we explain the why, which is because we think an employee who feels seen, heard, known, cared for, is much more likely to be a better mom, sister, coach, neighbor, friend, child, everything. Every every part of your life can rise on the tide of being honored and loved and treasured at work, right? So we see that as a so that. It's not so that we can make more money, though that is often a byproduct of somebody who's engaged and enjoys and finds meaning in their work. And so it becomes this great, our, our only economic objective at Hershend is growth. And with, you know, constraints around our growth, obviously, in terms of our uh, cap table and the way we leverage the business and such, but really we don't, we simply want to grow partly because we feel like that gives people opportunity to move into positions of increasing responsibility and scope over time. So tactically, you said it, incentives are so important. Incentives need to be thought through so carefully in this world because you get what you measure and what you compensate. And, you know, we have, for example, I mean, it's just one tactical example, but we have, like many of the folks on this uh, panel, I'm sure do, we measure not only the results you get, but how you get your results. And we survey the people that work for you as part of your compensation. Your incentive comp comes partly as a result of financial performance, but only partly. And if you've got a system that says, hey, people are really important and all these things matter and the way you work matters, but you're only paid on economics, um, you're, you're miscommunicating that. And so we've got a number of things we've kind of engineered into our business that are not just incentive driven, but they are intended to be almost a, um, what we learned in business school was called an expensive signal. You, you can say certain things are important, but until you're investing in it, until you're putting money behind it, um, it's not going to happen. And what we found is that over time, we've actually lowered our growth target as shareholders over time from where we started in 98 till now, we've actually lowered it. So we measure it only as uh, EBITDA growth or operating uh, profit. We lowered that target and we've now consistently exceeded that target by almost 50% for over 25 years. So our CAGR on our EBITDA growth has exceeded our target, though we have intentionally put more investment throughout the P&L, up, down, left, and right, than we ever planned on at the time we set the target. So it's really, I don't know that, I don't know that, again, I don't know that I can explain it through management skill and great board or great ownership. It's just something that starts to compound to your benefit when you're doing the right things for the right reasons in the right way. And um, like was said earlier, patiently thinking in generations and not just in quarters. If we were trying to do all this and get maybe results in a year or even 18 months, I think we'd been very discouraged right away. Oh, thank you, Chris. Very uh, powerful points. Ikti, can you tell us a little how you deliver a strategy like uh, a better role for pets, for example? How can you practically do that? Yeah, I mean, no, Chris, first, I, I just loved... Uh, the way you described, uh, you know, how you're bringing a purpose to life. I think in the way I would describe it is, you know, we are here to serve and solve uh, pet parenting pain points. And that mission is actually an infinite game. It's not a game that's going to be finished in a quarter. It's not a game that's going to be finished in a year. To yeah. evolve and actually solve those pet parent pain points and actually get to a place where actually pet parents can enjoy the benefits of companionship with their pets. That's where our true north is. And actually our true measure of success is a net promoter score where all the pet parents actually have all the time in the world to actually enjoy that bond with their, with their companion versus have pain points. And to do that, it will take generations. So we are obsessed with that. 
So once you get obsessed with that problem, then the result of that is innovation, which drives financial results, right? A lot of times in business, we are too busy looking at the scorecard and not looking at the ball and actually playing the game itself. And the game for us is infinite game. So I think that's that's the fundamental uh, you know, premise that I would give you. And I'll give you an example of how we have kind of brought this to life. So we have a beautiful business called Royal Canin. It's a therapeutic uh, business of, you know, when pet, uh, pets get sick, uh, they actually need some therapeutic diets. And the mission of this company, the purpose of this company is health through nutrition. And through working with veterinarians and with uh, breeders, they found out in one in five puppies actually don't live beyond two weeks. So that's about 20% of the entire puppy population actually dies. And so RC Royal Canin actually went on a, a panel um, where they actually did a, did a program with the natural, uh, vet, National Veterinary School in Toulouse uh, and worked with 300 breeders for five years and came up with a whole uh, study to understand this better. And they launched a groundbreaking breaking product. And that actually product was a, was a product that reduced neonatal deaths. Uh, it was called Puppy Protec. It was a milk replacement, a supplement and uh, actually has transformed that relationship. So one would say that, well, why would you actually go after such a niche product that only solves you know, puppy uh, problems, only which is a problem for veterinarians? But because we went beyond just the financial metrics, what we did was we actually anchored on, we are solving a, a pain point that exists in the lives of pets. It's a pain point that exists in the lives of breeders and, and the veterinarians. And we looked at the bigger purpose of what we we're trying to achieve. And through that, we were able to solve a pain point that existed, which has then led to social capital being developed with the veterinarians and the breeders who then recommend our products. And the business has then been able to grow even more. So that's an example of how we bring it to life. Now that's, a, that's a great example. So basically what you're saying is that if you can solve a pain point by growing the form of capital, in this case, what you call social capital, that's missing from a relationship, that actually what you're doing is you're releasing greater value creation, greater performance of that ecosystem and delivering the purpose, if I understand yes. you correctly. No, that's, that's right. That's, that's terrific. Um, maybe I could just move quickly before coming back to, to Morton, to, uh, to Meta in the international organization space. And so what about at the United Nations, Meta? What, what is the stated purpose of the UN Global Compact and Prime within that? And how can you, how have you kind of thought specifically about how you can deliver that purpose through strategy? Yeah, no, thank you. I'm really enjoying listening into the conversation here. I think one of the things, again, me coming from the perspective or the focus of higher education, I think it's very important when we talk about sustainable development and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that this is, of course, a lot to do with developing the right, you could say, technical skills, uh, the in sort of instrumental skills, if you like, but it's uh, also much more than that. I think we come with a mandate as higher education, not just to go, there is a, in Germany, the Humboldtian University has the concept of distinguishing between Bildung and Ausbildung. Bildung, that is the obligation we have to educate our students with the technical skill sets. They need to know how to, how to read a balance sheet. They, they need to know how to do their accounting, how to do their marketing, all those kinds of technical skills that are uh, basic skill sets to be learned but they also we also have a responsibility to ensure the ausbildung and the ausbildung has to do with creating civil citizens global citizens of the world that come out with a sense of the um, understanding of how we respect each other how we have empathy for each other how we have a, sort of a, a dignity for each other uh, in terms of also creating that curiosity that morton was talking about before and a kind of a sense of urgency for uh, our planet and for our co-human uh, beings in the world. And I'm afraid of, for example, something like the polarization in the, happening right now in the world is something that um, we do not take seriously enough in higher education. And I think that is kind of the ausbuilding, that we need our students to understand that, yes, they need the technical skills, but we also need to uh, let, let them understand and and develop those Ausbildung skills, those global citizen skills that are also needed and also much needed in 
in businesses to be uh, businesses uh, for, for good. Thank you, Meta. Morten, I'd like to just come back to you on this purpose question because uh, uh, I saved you for last on this topic for a reason. And it's really because I'm fascinated by uh, your uh, executive vice president portfolio and the fact that Novo Enzymes or Novozymes rather has uh, seemed to intentionally create this portfolio as a collection of all of the major purpose related entities in the organization from HR to sustainability to corporate affairs and communications and brand. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about why Novozymes decided to do this and how are you bringing all these functions that are under your control together to deliver purpose specifically through strategy? And does you know, having this kind of portfolio that's far reaching make it easier to do that? Yes and no. Um, but I, I think actually, so listening to, to the last couple of comments, especially Chris and uh, Ikti, you need to go out and play to win and not play to avoid losing. And I think a lot of us, we are educated in the same uh, methodologies in business schools that we know how to optimize on a balance sheet and the short term profits will show right away in the next quarter. And the challenge is that you need to invest for the long run and you need to be able to articulate the narrative. You need to be able to be present in the challenges that we are facing. We are seeing a world today that are uh, seeing dramatic challenges, whether it has been COVID or now we're seeing wars again breaking out in Europe, whether we are seeing supply chain disruption, we are seeing famine again in the big continents. There's starting to be a significant challenge. And everyone, to Meta's point also, this polar polarization is starting to become a problem. Employees, current and future employees, they want to work for employers that has the ability to articulate and be actually representing their voice. And I think companies that has a strong purpose, that has the ability to articulate that drive, that narrative into creating long-term growth, they actually are the ones succeeding. So having the ability to take a stand in our uh, purpose, being able to articulate that when it comes to a brand, to the way we talk to our uh, markets, to the way we talk and advocate for biotechnology and how we are advocating for a fossil paradigm shift in the world, or it's how we actually go out and we communicate towards uh, our current and, and future employees, just makes more sense uh, why at times, yes, it's extremely fun and it's extremely easy because it's so coherent. It's the same message with a different tonality, but it's, of course, extremely difficult because what we here are addressing and, and, and talking to is truly, as uh, we heard from Lindsay's uh, final remark in the, in the last uh, comment, was that companies, we need to react, we need to change, and we need to evolve to meet both the societal uh, pressures, the uh, financial, uh, economical pressures, and then the expectations from, uh, from our employees and future employees. Thank you, Morton. I wonder, Rick Deep and Chris, uh, do either of you have... Um any roles, any functions that are sort of similar to uh, to Morton's, where they're where they're intentionally grouped together, or, or and if you don't, how how do those entities that are really meant to drive purpose in the company, how do they integrate and collaborate? Uh, Morton's position is the coolest job on the planet. I mean, that's fantastic. That to be able to go sideline to sideline like that, with a laser focus on purpose, would be just an extraordinary uh, privilege. That is really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, start off by saying that, you know, I, I fundamentally believe that what makes the edge of a company is the culture. And what I and all of my associates try and do is we want to wake up every day in the morning thinking about how to solve pet parent pain points. I think if you end up having that kind of a mindset and that kind of inspires you, then everything else flows off that. And I think, uh, you know, as a leader, what I try to do is always embody that and role model that and show up with that curiosity and show up with that, you know, obsession with the outside of actually always being curious about, like, what exactly is the pain point? What, what is coming in the way? How could we do better? And it's the continuous mindset of always wanting to do better and solve problems. And that if, if I do it, and if 100,000 associates with me do it, then you know the rest of it is just easy. So it's a bit of, I would say, the purpose is kind of like every single associate should be the chief purpose officer. 
And that's kind of our goal. And it comes through in the culture of the company. Um, and that's what we try to embody uh, in every, every meeting, every single connection we have as a team. Oh, thank you. Actually, while I still have you here, Ikdeep, yeah, as a, it was a good reminder from Morden in his answer that really the overall theme of this forum is about the role of business in addressing systemic crises, you know, given governments are increasingly burdened by debt and often have limited reach compared to corporations. So I wonder if you've got any specific initiatives in your specific business that actually uh, demonstrate a commitment to mitigating crises. You know, for example, during the pandemic due to war, supply chain disruptions, inflation, labor shortages, talent retention, whatever you feel is the most relevant uh, to your example. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one which is linked to our purpose. So, you know, we, we, we have pedigree as the biggest dog brand in the world. And we believe that we make, a, you know, pets make our lives better because they offer companionship and love. And it's proven in, in studies that pet ownership actually drives uh, better aging uh, of older people. And so through the pandemic, we actually saw a big spike in, in consumers uh, wanting to actually uh, adopt more pets. But the problem was that the shelters were kind of closed. And so you could not actually access, um, access the shelters to actually adopt. So one of the things that we actually did was we actually launched uh, used technology to launch uh, dogs on Zoom. Uh, it was an initiative uh, with Pedigree US. And we actually ended up uh, actually enabling and covering uh, the adoption fees for pets and also transportation costs. So we actually would transport, if you adopted the pet, we would pay for the costs and also the transportation costs. And as a result, there was no physical contact needed and we were still able to unite the pets. And through that you know, activation, of course, uh, again, you, know, you do good, you activate on your purpose, you solve pain points, and through that we are seeing our equities of our brands improve uh, and overall the business do better. Thank you, Chris. Can I go back to you and just ask if um, in your industry, you're looking at these crises in a specific way where you've launched initiatives to help mitigate them as part of what you do? Well, not in, a, not in the last 18, 24 months that I would say, I think everything that happened to us, everything we did to respond to COVID and the crises that came from us that way was born out of kind of accelerating the things we were already doing. You know, we have a, we have a, a program called Share It Forward that basically serves our employees uh, in times of need. And that got, you know, sort of accelerated during COVID in terms of our ability to reach and serve our populations. But I think more than I'm, I'm sort of comforted when I think through like, what did we do or change? Because doing the right things faster or better is a great solution. I mean, it's sort of something I was frankly really proud of our team for. What the other thing I would say that is really kind of comforting is that a lot of what we're doing isn't new. We didn't come up with a lot of our ideas. We borrowed them. I mean, uh, Meta mentioning Ausbildung a moment ago. It's I've never heard this word. So I look it up and I'm like, this is what we try to do. We try to think about things and iterate. And I think uh, Morton said it, you know, playing the game rather than just looking at the scorecard. You know, you put yourself in a position where you are in ready to serve. Uh, when there's a need. And I think that may be more than maybe more than a lot of the other tactics we can dream up is the most important thing. There's a, there's an old principle, for example, in Hebrew culture called the gleaning principle. I think the word is sadaka in Hebrew. And it basically says you don't maximize profit. You leave something behind. You make sure that there's enough for the sojourner or the poor in your community. And it was an agricultural reference back then, but I think it absolutely applies today. And so in times of crisis, global crisis, a company that's got that mindset ought to be in a great position to serve its community, whether it's the sense of place you talked about earlier, Jay, or the global community through exports or services or manufacturing or tools or trade. There's lots of things we can do, but it's more challenging to be nimble and ready for that and have sort of your head and heart in the right place than it is to perhaps spool up a new system. Uh, the example Ikdeep gave is a totally great example of a whole new system that came out of a demonstrated need, but it, it happened because like he said, he was in the position obsessed with this problem to begin with. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, I like those points very much. You know, Lindsay Stroud, uh, the, the MBA keynote who came before this panel, she talked about um, I've with... already offered her a job, by the way. We've already closed the deal. It's done. So everybody can. 
Congratulations, Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> now, she talked about uh, you stepping into a crisis with a business mindset, but also a public-private partnership kind of one, where she partnered with Airbnb, created a, um, I think she said she created a nonprofit to house uh, Ukrainian refugees. So I just wanted to throw it back to Morton, uh, since you, you started us down this pathway. Is there anything very specific in terms of crisis-related initiatives that you'd like to flag before we move into conclusion? Yeah, but but I, I'm I'm actually maybe I'm gonna repeat a bit like what Chris also said because it's not like we came up with a complete new idea and, and alternate it, but we we actually looked at some of the challenges that we already had and some of the products we had, and then looked at it in a new context. For instance, when we saw um, the war starting out in, in February 24 last year, and we started seeing some of the consequences into. Uh, Q2 last year that fertilizers were not being able to ship from Russia into Africa and especially to the Horn of Africa because there was an embargo on fertilizers coming out of, out of Russia. We then actually had the ability to take a biological fertilizer that we are selling in North America and Europe. What about we got that recertified and actually starting having that sent to Africa instead of? So going out and, and thinking through how can we utilize UNDP, how can we work with uh, other uh, NGOs in being able to meet that demand and that requirement. We have never sold our product in Africa because there hasn't been a, a business uh, need or a business play for us, but we have the technology, we have the minds, and it's just down to some engineers turning around and saying, hey, these are the challenges that we'll be facing. How do we push this big in, back in? Um, and I think that that's where when you start listening to people and start having them come together with ideas and let it grow from your societal needs, then it's all of a sudden going to be uh, much more interesting. And we've seen the same with both uh, working with NGOs. Right now we're working with a local NGO that are non-religious and non-governmental tied in, in Turkey on how to actually uh, help the local communities in the eastern part of the country with the latest earthquake. So much more engaging and involving the uh, individuals that has this uh, challenge and this feeling of belonging in that community, in that place where they are, that's where it then starts to be really strong. And you can truly maximize and emphasize it that from a corporate perspective. But I will never say that uh, we can come out with the greatest ideas sitting in headquarter because we will be bombarded with everything. So having actually letting that innovation or that idea flow being let go, set that free in the organization and then support it to be able to uh, come up with new ideas. That for us has really been a, a big driver. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. I think this has just been a wonderful, thought-provoking panel. And I think uh, many of the issues that you've surfaced from the vision through the purpose to the actual practical enactment, that this is going to be very stimulating. There'll be catalysts for further discussions throughout this forum. We just have a few minutes left, and I wanted to give each of you just a chance to leave us with a final thought. Meta, can we start with you? Yes, no, thank you very much. Then I will just very briefly uh, pick up on where Morten left the conversation here, the focus on multi-stakeholder partnerships. I think that is such a wonderful example of where the world is going, the world has to go. And then we as uh, educators of the future leaders need to ensure that our students learn how to engage and mobilize and inspire uh, and make those uh, successful uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Morten. you have any final thoughts? Yeah, continue to everyone who is, who's here on the call, who is uh, doing uh, leadership for the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years, continue to challenge yourself and be curious. That's the way we are going to be pushing forward and being curious in the way you're coming up with new ideas and engaging. And to this, uh, Smith is also saying the multilateral uh, collaborations. This is where the true magic is uh, released. So keep on being curious. Excellent. Ikti. Uh, thank you for having me here, first of all. And I would just say to all the all the attendees, uh, you know, just believe in the role a business can play in society um, and then to think beyond just themselves. Um, I'm witnessing it being a part of a great organization on how, you know, businesses can be a big, big catalyst in driving the change you want to see in the world. And that can happen and you're the future. So I count on all of, all of you and all of us to make that happen. Chris, I'll give you the final say. 
there's a lot of pressure, but I mean, I've taken a page full of notes myself, so I'm sure other folks are enjoying what the other uh, panelists have shared. Uh, curiosity, humility, love. Love makes a lot of this go. And the way you treat other people when you're coming from a perspective of love changes um, almost everything in the way you see them and think about them. And then just for day to day, I mean, just these people who are willing to share their time and their ideas and their experience, they're all over the place. I'm thinking of other folks you've got coming up in the next few days. I'm thinking a spectacular time I shared with you, Jay, and Gavin Long, who's speaking later, and others who are just willing to share their wisdom. Um, and I hope all of us will continue to do that as we uh, gather new ideas and new knowledge. Well, again, a big thank you to all of our panelists. I know that you have lead very, very busy lives. I know you're all very influential in your spaces as well. So thank you for what you're doing and, and you're just setting a shining example for, uh, for folks going forward. So again, thank you to the audience as well for joining us. And I just encourage you to continue on with today's forum and also uh, during the sessions over the next couple of days. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. And Jay, thank you for fantastic moderation uh, of that conversation. So next up, uh, I would like to invite our next two uh, speakers to our stage. We are going to be uh, treated to a fireside chat conversation between uh, Anne Florini, who is a fellow at New America and also a professor of practice at Thunderbird ASU, a former professional professor at the National University of Singapore and a former senior fellow at Brookings as well as Peter Baker, who is the CEO of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So welcome, Anne and Peter, to the stage. Let me start by asking you a very broad general question. As you know, business has primarily been looking at its role in dealing with the world's big issues in terms of making relatively minor changes, significant changes, but not huge transformational ones. Things like ESG, just do less harm. CSR, give some money back. And we all know that that's not what business is being asked to do now. So when you approach business leaders, when you talk with them about why it is we need systemic transformational change, how do you do those conversations and how receptive are they to them? Yeah, that's that's a great question and um, I think the uh, the way that we deal with it is uh, two years ago uh, we ended a period of uh, more than two years working with more than 40 companies on the vision 2050 time to transform in which we basically laid out the three big challenges the world is now dealing with climate change which we call the climate emergency the loss of nature and mounting inequality and we, in that report, came to the conclusion that the only way that we can deal with this is radical system transformation. The incremental improvement model of business will have to come to an end. We have to radically rethink the way that we produce the energy that we need, the mobility, the food, and all other aspects of products and services that business provides to society. That has become uh, the conversation in WBCSD. We've translated that into a number of membership criteria. So we have said companies need to have a net zero target that is science informed and have to have a transition plan that shows that by 2030, they're on track according to science. They need to have nature positive statements. They need to respect and, uh, and support human rights in supply chains, uh, the, uh, the diversity and inclusion aspects of business, and they need to adhere to the highest levels of transparency. So all that is now put in place. Companies are, are being uh, held accountable for that uh, set of criteria. And that has fundamentally changed the conversation we have with businesses and with the CEOs of those companies. So it sounds like a lot of progress has been made on the conversation and the mindset and the understanding of what needs to happen. What are you seeing in terms of practice as to what they're actually doing? Because you've certainly seen all the coverage about greenwashing and net zero being all about planting more trees than the planet can hold. So there's some skepticism about what's actually going to get transformed. Are there good news stories, examples to point to of that we're really seeing transformation yet? Yeah, I think if you, the, the, the big progress is, is what, what I can see is that 
sustainability has now really gone mainstream. If you walk into any of the boardrooms of companies that we work with, climate is one of the top priorities that companies are discussing. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter almost which sector. Decarbonization is the topic that they're all wrestling with. Um, I would say one and a half, two years ago, the conversation was how do we actually set a science-based target? Now the conversation is what does achieving that target actually have to mean for our business models, our supply chains, but even the products and services that companies provide to the market? So it's a deep transformational conversation. And these transformations, uh, you know, take the energy system, take the, the mobility system, they are not fast transitions. It's not like, you know, in the old days when you did CSR, you could announce a giving back campaign or, or some type of uh, uh, doing good type of activity, which immediately led to an event, led to an announcement and attracted a lot of communication and publicity. These transitions are slow. I mean, uh, uh, four years ago, if you would have walked into the boardroom of a car company set, combustion engines are dead before 2030, you would have been thrown out of the room. If you go to those same board meetings now, the that's all they talk about. How can we accelerate? What are the rollout strategies for electric uh, mobility solutions? So it's really a conversation that is now deeply ingrained in boardrooms, board discussions, in strategy, but more importantly in R&D, in procurement, and then throughout all functions of, uh, of business. But again, uh, everything added up. The world is not yet on a trajectory to stay below one and a half degrees, uh, not even uh, on a trajectory to half emissions by 2030. So much more is needed. And so what is now needed is a conversation within boards, with companies, on what is your transition plan? What are the technologies, the product changes, your supply chain management that you're going to have to change. But the other one is how do we actually hold you accountable for the progress you're making? Because that's the missing element. That's many people, I many companies. That because accountability is. Yeah, that's the one. That's So uh, I think the good news is, I don't know the precise number at the moment, but eight and a half thousand or so companies have set science-based targets. But not all of them have created transition plans to deliver those targets. And even fewer of those have then uh, created uh, disclosures to, uh, to outside stakeholders on what the progress against those is. That's the unlock that we now need to work on. So what uh, last year in, in Sharm El Sheikh, the high level expert group published the Integrity Matters Report in which it said greenwashing needs to come to an end. Companies need to publish transition plans, need to disclose the impacts and the progress they're making. That now needs to really be embedded into business processes. And the interesting thing about that is we don't need to reinvent business. You know, if you look at the way that companies manage their financial performance, we can use the same processes, the same functions, in many cases, even the same systems. We just need to now make them aware that we're also going to hold them accountable for their carbon performance or for their biodiversity performance. And this, of course, is very much in keeping with the economics of mutuality way of approaching building a purpose driven business is there are metrics for natural capital and social capital that already exist that can be used by by businesses who have at least started on this journey. So I think that leaves us yep. with a couple of questions coming out of what you've just said. One is eight and a half thousand companies is a lot of companies, but compared to all the companies in the world, it's not really a lot of companies. So how do we get this to scale very rapidly? And the other is what is blocking among the companies who already basically get it, that they know that they have to start doing business differently. It's still happening very slowly. What are the major blockage points and how do we address those? Yeah, no, I think the, um, how do we accelerate the eight and a half thousand to become more? Uh, that's where the theory of tipping points will come in. You know, once, uh, and we can have long conversations, whether it's five, 10 or 20% of the sector changes, the sector as a whole will have to change. And that will, in my mind, be the, the element that will accelerate companies 
and whether they all set the SPTI framework targets or do it on another way, that's in the secondary conversation. But the transformations are becoming, um, uh, you, you can't deny them anymore. These will happen, these tipping points, we're very close to achieving those. Uh, the main gaps that we have to accelerate is really the, the consistent application and the comparability of the accountability system. So yes, the economics of mutuality are, are a great framework to A, bring purpose in a business, to create decision-making metrics inside companies. But what we also need to create is what is actually the metric that we're going to use to hold companies accountable? So take the example of carbon. How do we make the greenhouse gas protocol more robust? How do we actually get to product level scope three accounting metrics? So how do we actually get real-time carbon performance rather than based on all kinds of assessments and averages? And that's one element, and there's a lot of work going on in that, and give it a, a year, and then that will be pretty robust. And then the big play will be, how do we get the external disclosures to be comparable, i.e. what is the accounting rule for disclosing one's carbon performance? That's where the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, will play such an important role. Their framework will come out in the summer of this year. And then in COP28, the big push should be, how do we get as many countries in the world to make that a mandatory framework? Because the days of voluntary disclosure need to be over. Companies need to be held to account. And the best way to do it, just like in their financial performance, is to hold them to accounting rules that apply to all companies. And as such, will uh, create comparable data that then investors and other stakeholders can uh, can respond to. So it sounds like from everything you're saying, we've made a tremendous amount of progress. We're somewhat missing on the accounting and policy side in making things mandatory, but we're developing the tools that we need to be developing. Yeah. One of the phrases that I hear a lot is in all of this, this transition to sustainability, that it isn't the direction that's the problem, it's the pace that's the problem. That the speed at which all of this has to happen is so extraordinary and it requires so many changes in so many systems. You, I think it's helpful if people have a sense that not only is there a lot happening in these general terms, but a lot in specific industries where you're seeing us approach tipping points. You mentioned the EV example, I think that is a crucial one where all of a sudden it's very clear that that industry is going to be totally different in the next few years. Are there other examples like that where you see us getting close to tipping points that, where people can say, hey, this is a, an approach that actually works? Yeah, no, there's there's optimism in, in the examples with the subtext that the examples do not yet add up to enough skill and, and speed as you mentioned. But if you look in other examples, you know, the uh, the built environment, if we now see the speed at which the construction industry is rethinking the buildings we're going to build, how do we get to full carbon cycle uh, neutrality in new buildings? How do we build by 2030 all net zero buildings? That is quickly becoming the norm in that industry. And one one of the interesting experiments that we need to do is if you talk about system transformation, it's not only talking about does company A or B do enough and can we get them incentivized to do more? It's also what can we do on the demand side? So an example of that is, uh, let's take a city, you know, the city of London. How can we make sure that the city of London has a net zero plan by 2030? And those, those are now actually being developed. What does that mean for the construction industry in terms of the demand for building solutions or for mobile transport solutions or for energy solutions? Um, so how can we bring not only a supply of solutions uh, at scale, but how can we really create a demand signal that will incentivize business because that's where then the scale of, of solutions emerges. And that brings me to what you now see already in the renewable energy space where four or five years ago, we all talked about wind and solar, but the cost per unit of energy were much higher than a fossil fuel based. 
that because of the high demand for these solutions now has completely reversed. In most parts of the world, renewable energy is capable of providing cheaper energy than fossil fuel alternatives today are. So once you bring supply and demand signals in markets together so that companies have an incentive to invest, to scale, to drive innovation and unit cost improvements, then you get the speed that we need. And then you see governments finally starting to step up and create that demand and create incentives like the American Inflation Reduction Act. Then yep. business works its magic of efficiently driving us along cost reduction curves and all of a sudden what seemed impossible becomes not only possible but inevitable. We are almost What's out happening? of time. Yep. Let me end with one question. What are the recommendations you have for the business leaders who are watching this? Because we have an extraordinary audience here, many of whom I'm sure are your members, but some who are not and should be. What is it that you want them to do next? And how should they be thinking about the whole systemic transformation set of obligations and interests that they're now facing? I think any business leader needs to make uh, at least two things happen. Translate your climate targets, uh, keep it to climate for a second, into transition plans that you're willing to publish. Show the world how you will get to those targets, because not enough companies are doing that. But secondly, make sure that your company and all the systems and functions that operate in the company are ready for the world in which you will be held accountable for the progress that the company is making. Because it takes a good amount of time to change your accounting systems, but also the accountability system within the company to be able to hold people to account, incentivize them, pay bonuses for not just the financial performance, but the carbon performance of the business as well. And if a company is not on the track to have their systems ready for that world, which is also inevitable, and which in my mind will be inevitable two years from now, then you're going to be locked out. You're not going to be able to, to manage that performance and you're going to lose the public uh, affairs battle that, uh, that the companies will then face. And so be ahead of that game, get your CFO on this case, because it's no longer the CSO that will be driving this conversation. It will be the, the core uh, operating functions and, the, and, and in many companies that will be organized by the CFO which is a big agenda, but as you've been saying, there are a lot of tools and processes and groups out there to help businesses make that transition. And I hope they heed your call. Peter, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much, Peter and Anne, for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Uh, as you know, we have about an hour left in the program reserved for anyone that might be interested in doing some speed networking. So before I kind of close out our time together here formally on the main stage, just wanted to make sure that you knew how to participate in speed networking if you're interested. Uh, you are able to look at the people tab inside of the event space, and you can select a opportunity to join the speed networking session. And through the magic of technology, you'll be paired with another attendee at random, uh, almost as if you're grabbing coffee in between uh, live conference sessions when we we're in live person at conferences, and you'll have a chance to speak through video chat for a short time. Uh, if you'd like to, you'll also have the opportunity to share your details and stay in touch. So we invite you to take advantage of that, to meet the amazing uh, participants that are joining us from around the world, and also hope that you really enjoyed the conversation today. We have enjoyed having you here, uh, having the engagement back and forth between those of you in the audience, as well as the speakers on stage, uh, big thank you to all of the speakers who made time to come and share their perspectives and hope that you were able to see a lot of common themes. You know, we heard the language of curiosity and transparency and uh, also the theme that we really need to look inside of ourselves to not only find what role we might be able to play in this acceleration, but what work we might be able to do to grow our capacity uh, and be able to live out the purpose uh, in our lives and in our companies. So we hope that's given you a lot uh, to think about when we are rethinking how to rewire our business models and the role that you're able to play in accelerating that change. Thank you so much for being here. We truly enjoyed 
spending the time with you and we look forward to seeing you. Same time, same place tomorrow, we'll be discussing the role of the investors, the standard setters and the regulators. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon.